This is flipped mini lecture number 21, More Fun with Dot Products. I don't feel quite done with what we did in 9.3. At least I need to show you this. If A and B are two vectors with components AX, BX, AY, BY, AZ, and BZ, then we know, in fact, I defined it this way, that a dot b is ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. But I also said that a dot b is supposed to equal the length of a times the length of b times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And I said I'd prove that to you. So here's a proof that I'm not entirely satisfied with, but it's decent. Let's so oppose that this is true, that the length of A and the length of B is A times B times cosine theta. And now let's write A as AX times I hat plus AY times J hat plus AK times K hat. And that I need to dot into B. And how am I going to write B? Well, I'm going to write B as BX times I hat plus BY times J hat plus BZ times K hat. Now I've got three things in the first term and three things in the second term. So that means I've got nine things total. That means I have an AX BX term. that's got i hat dot i hat in it. And I have an ax by term that has an i hat dot j hat in it. And I have an ax bz term which has an i hat dot k hat in it. And I still got six more terms to write out. So I wrote out all nine terms for you. And that looks like an awful mess. But some of these are actually pretty easy. You see this one here that says i hat dot i hat? We have the ax bx i hat dot i hat. That's this first term right here. And that's got an i hat dot i hat in it. And i hat dot i hat is a unit vector pointing this way dotted into a unit vector pointing that way. Which if this formula is true, would be the length of the first unit vector, which is of course one, times the length of the second vector, which is of course one, times the cosine of the angle between them, which is the cosine of zero degrees, which is one. So i hat dot i hat, if this formula is true, is one. Now, similarly down here, j hat dot j hat is 1. And similarly down here, k hat dot k hat is 1. So at least three of these terms have gotten the load simpler. Now here we have, see this thing right here? ax times by, which came with an i hat dot j hat. What do we know with the i hat dot j hat? Well, if this formula up here is true, that's the length of i hat, which is 1, times the length of j hat, which is 1, times, now this is interesting, i hat points that way, and j hat points that way, and that's 90 degrees, and cosine of 90 degrees is 0. So i hat dot j hat is 1 times 1 times 0. So this entire thing goes away. Similarly, i hat dot k hat, entire thing goes away. Down here, j hat dot i hat, all that junk goes away. j hat dot k hat. That's two more vectors that are at 90 degrees to each other. j hat might 
if I hat points that way and J hat points that way, then K hat points towards you. And J hat dot K hat also have 90 degrees between them. So A, Y, B, Z, J hat dot K hat, that's zero. K hat dot I hat, zero. K hat dot J hat, zero. So look what we're left with. If you believe this formula, and if you write a vector out in terms of its components, then we have shown that a dot b is ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. Okay, so maybe you believe that these two ways of writing dot products are equivalent. So now I want to show you something else we can do with that. Remember how we have this situation from the last flip lecture where we've shown that the work done is equal to the sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of delta r sub i dot f sub i. This was the if you don't remember that, you need to go back to the previous flipped lecture and understand how if the path is curvy or if the force is varying, then the work needs to be busted up into all these little bits of work. And then we need to sum them up to get the work done by this force on this particle as it traverses this path. Well, let's take a look at one of those. Here we have delta r sub i. I just drew it in some random direction. Here we have f sub i. I drew it in some random direction. And now we know this that, that if we look at this angle theta here, then delta r i dot f sub i is the length of this times the length of this times the cosine of the angle between them. But the cosine of this angle times the length of f sub i has the interpretation of being the amount of f sub i that is parallel to r sub i. So let's see this f sub i right here. I'm breaking it into a piece that's parallel to r sub i and a piece that's perpendicular to delta r sub i. And the, this piece, the length of that piece, is the length of this piece times cosine of theta. So what we see here is that we now have a new interpretation of delta ri dot f sub i. Delta ri dot f sub i is the length of delta ri times the length of f sub i but only that amount which is in the direction of the motion. So the component of F that is in the direction of the motion is what is appearing on this side. And then this is the amount of motion in the direction of the motion. So if we call the direction of the motion S, And we say that a little distance delta s has been traversed. And we look at the component of f in that. We now have that this piece here is fs sub i times delta s sub i. That's our new interpretation of what delta ri dot f sub i is. And now... This sum then becomes sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of fsi delta si. And now we really can see that this is an integral. And this is the integral that Knight gave on nine, equation 9.10, page 211. And this is Knight's version of work. He says, work... Once you take the limit that delta s goes to 0, and actually I say that this is an integral, work is equal to the integral along the path from s initial to s final of the component of f along the path ds. 
Now I'll tell you what, this is the actual genuine definition of work when the force is varying all over the map and the path is curvy, okay? But I'm gonna make your life simpler. I'm never, at least for any time in the near future, going to bother you with the case where both the path is curvy and the force is changing as you go along the path. I won't mess you up with that horrible complicated case. I'll either make the path straight and then I will make the force varying in direction. So I'll either have straight paths with varying forces or I'll have curved paths but with constant forces. So there's a curved path but at least I will make the force constant the entire way along the path. So with that simplification, we are going to do quite a few calculations of integral of fs ds from the initial point in the path to the final point in the path. So I've finally gotten equation 9.10 the way Knight gets it in section 9.2. And this is the fully general version where you can actually have varying forces and crazy S-shaped paths. The other thing I've managed to accomplish in this is I've derived a few more formulas that were in 9.3. That was my fun with dot products. And so in the next flipped mini lecture, I'll finally get to go on to 9.4, which is a model of springs and the work done by a spring.